Well, hello, and welcome to our third Zoom session on the middle ear. Today we will finish the coverage of the middle ear, and in upcoming Zoom sessions we will move into the inner ear, where we will also spend at least, I'd say, four weeks on the inner ear. So, this being our session on the middle ear, we've, the past two weeks we've looked at the middle ear. Today we'll finish that in 120 anatomy and physiology. So, I had something stuck in my lip here. There we go. <laughs> At any rate, without any further ado, let's go into the notes. So, let's I'll share screen here. And we'll take a look see at where we were regarding the middle ear. If I back off a little bit here. Okay. Last week we looked at how the middle ear overcomes the impedance mismatch. Make sure you keep in mind the three ways in which the, the impedance mismatch between air and fluid is overcome by means of the middle ear. And we said when we combine all of these things, you get a pressure increase of about 44 to 1. And why this is a 2 here is beyond me, but don't worry about that. Here, we'll make it a 1. And we'll make this one here a one, a two, a three. So anyway, and then I said, recall from acoustics course that a 10 to 1 pressure increase is 20 dB increase. A 100 to 1 pressure increase is a 40 decibel increase. And the 44 to 1 pressure increase offered by the middle ear results in somewhere between 20 and 40 which is about between 30 and 35 dB of extra added gain given by the middle ear. So, and then we also looked at in our notes, moving on down here, we said, however, that the maximum conductive hearing loss is often more than this, and this should read 30 to 35 here, okay? If the middle ear makes up between 30 and 35 dB, a conductive hearing loss can be more than this, and that can happen when you have, here, here's the question in PowerPoint. If the middle ear normally makes up some 30 to 35 dB, then why can a conductive hearing loss be often more than this? Ordinarily, when this window pushes in, the round window can bulge. But if that cannot happen, the hearing loss will be more than what the middle ear makes up. So it's that interchange. And if that is stopped, for whatever reason, you will have a problem, a middle ear problem. And those things we will be looking at today, what are those pathologies that cause this to happen when you can no longer push on that such that this bulges out? We'll take a look, see at that. Let's look something here at this picture. This is showing the resonance of the middle ear. Now we've covered the resonance of the outer ear in past classes, didn't we? Have a look over here. Outer ear canal resonance. With a peak around 2700 hertz, the resonance picks up past 1000, is especially most pronounced between three, two to three to 4000 hertz and then drops off. We even said that's the reason for the shape of noise-induced hearing loss. We said that in 110 acoustics earlier today. So if you take a look at the outer ear canal resonance, as is drawn there, outer ear canal resonance, as is drawn here. Now, if you're wondering what these are, ear canal resonance, concha bowl resonance, add those two together, you get this, about a 20 decibel increase. And then look on the left, you've got the resonance of the middle ear ossicles and the middle ear space. The middle ear space and the middle ear ossicles have their own resonances, kind of a lit right around here, okay? 1,000 to 2,000 a bit, mostly at 2, actually, at 2,000 hertz, and then you get a couple other resonances. Let's look in our notes, and I'll show you something here in the notes. In the notes, it says, resonances of the middle ear. I'll make that a little bit bigger. Resonances of the middle ear ossicles is around 2,000 hertz on an audiogram or a hearing test 
much as we looked at this morning in acoustics in the acoustics course, you may notice a slight improvement at 2000 hertz, especially if the person has an, a conductive hearing loss. The loss might pick up a little bit, show a little bit less hearing loss at 2000 hertz due to the resonance of the middle ear ossicles. Now, the two other resonant frequencies, tympanic membrane, the cavity itself, the ossicles, you've got another set of resonances here and another resonance here, all giving rise essentially to basically a middle ear contribution as well. So you've got the middle ear contribution plus the outer ear contribution. And that's why I'm saying this plus this equals this. Now remember what we were talking about in acoustics this morning, where I said our best hearing sensitivity is around between one and 4,000 hertz. See that? And look at here, it takes more to hear 250 hertz, more for us to hear 500 hertz, but our hearing is best right here. And this is showing you the amount of pressure it takes to just barely hear all the different frequencies. And you can see that it's shaped like a smile. We actually have uneven hearing sensitivity across the frequencies. Ideally, this 1000 hertz should be right down at zero, but you know what I mean, okay? It's just giving you the general gist of things. So there it is, shown even better. This slide's black and white, now it's shown even better. Look closely at the slide. Okay, read what it says in yellow on the top. The resonances of the outer and middle ears together create an equal loudness curve that shows our best hearing sensitivity is between 1 to 4,000 hertz. Now, these are equal loudness things. First, let's look at the yellow. The resonance of the outer ear and conchabol plus the resonance of the middle ear Put those together gives you the yellow. Now the yellow you'll learn after in acoustics class, you'll learn after your midterm these two terms. Right now don't worry so much about them. You need to know what the yellow line represents. It's the softest it took to hear all the different frequencies, not just a thousand hertz. Remember we defined zero dBSPL in 110 acoustics as the softest it took to hear a 1000 hertz tone at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears? Well, that's why 1000 hertz here, look where my cursor is, is right at zero. We'll call that zero dBSPL. Ding! But what if we played that game with other frequencies? Let's say we played 250 hertz from a speaker and the, we played the, and what was the softest it took for us to just barely hear a 250 hertz tone at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears? Ding, 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 ding. Look at that. More. What about, a, what's the softest it took to hear 125 hertz at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears? Look at that. Way more. The sweet spot is right here. Look at this. What's the soft, whoops, what's the softest it takes to hear a 2000 hertz tone at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears? Look at 2000. It's less than zero dB SPL. So you see, zero dB SPL does not mean the absence of sound. It's defined as the softest it took to hear a 1000 hertz tone at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears. At any rate, the reason for the curve, the reason for the uneven hearing sensitivity we have across the frequencies, the reason we hear some frequencies softer at a softer level than we hear other frequencies is due to the resonances of the outer ear and the resonances of the middle ear. Add those two together, you got the curves. Now the white curve with a little bump on it. That's the softest it took to hear all the different frequencies with one ear under a headphone. Okay, and two ears are better than one. That's why two ears can hear softer than one ear can. 
But we'll learn more about this in acoustics after the midterm. Just count this as a, what we're talking about here is the physiology of the middle ear, but that's how it all plays in a part regarding our hearing sensitivity. We learned last week about the overcoming the impedance mismatch, okay? Today we're talking about how it, uh, how it actually adds to our best hearing sensitivity being at specific frequencies. Okay, mainly between right here and right here. It's all due to these resonances. So we said last week, too, that the middle ear changes or transduces energy from one form to another. Remember that, too, right? It changes sound waves into mechanical piston-like energy. The inner ear takes that and changes that into hydraulic fluid energy. And then the hair cells inside the inner ear take that hydraulic fluid energy and change that into electricity. So the several changes or transductions that the ear does to sound in order to create neural messages in the brain. So anyway, so there. And then this section we covered, this section we covered, you should read that slide. Normally the oval window pushed inward bulges the round. If you pushed the round window inward, it would bulge the oval. Energy to both windows simultaneously, that interaction is gone. The cochlea will not be activated with 30 to 35 dB inputs. The conductive hearing loss will therefore be more. When we say 60 with TDH39s, that means circumoral headphones that we use to test hearing. Okay, so I'll take this now and just kind of, whoops, and look at our notes. Remember right where it says that, right here too. Basically, put a star by this section here too. The maximum conductive hearing loss that you can measure depends on the headphone used in the hearing test. So the maximum conductive hearing loss that you can measure is about 60 through the circumoral headphones or TDH39 headphones, and it's a little larger with insert headphones, headphones with a little yellow tip that are stuck inside your ear. And what do we mean by airbone gap? Airbone gap. I'll stop sharing and tell you about airbone gap, okay? Air conduction. Sound coming through the air, okay, hitting your ear. How, how much, how loud did the sound have to be for you to hear it? Air conduction, sound waves traveling through the air. When you wear a set of headphones or a insert headphones, you're still talking air conduction because the sound is coming through the headphone and going down your ear canal, which is filled with air, and it hits the drum and wiggles the bones and blah, 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 blah. Okay, bone conduction basically is this. Bone con here's air conduction, and here's bone conduction. Putting the tuning fork on the mastoid bone, you'll hear it through bone, air, bone, air. Now this, and I've said this earlier in a past Zoom session too, this is the Rene tuning fork test. The doc doctors use this to tell whether you have middle ear pathology or not. You should hear by bone conduction, but when you play by air conduction should be louder. This should sound louder than this. And the reason is that 30 to 35 dB that the middle ear is adding or making up, okay? If this does not sound louder than this, then your middle ear isn't working properly, okay? There's another tuning fork test too called the Bing tuning fork test. We covered that one several weeks ago. Outer ear, okay? When we talked occlusion effect. Tuning fork, here. Tuning fork on the bone, if I plug my ear, it should get louder. Unplug, should get softer. Plug, louder. 
unplug softer the occlusion effect low frequency bone conducted sounds resonate the mass of your skull which in turn resonates the cartilaginous portion of your ear canal plugging your ear prevents that from escaping five things low frequency bone conducted sound resonates massive skull which in turn resonates cartilaginous portion of ear canal plugging your ear prevents that from escaping the lay definition of the occlusion effect your own voice gets louder when your ear is plugged well the bone conducted portion of your own voice the way you hear your voice through the bone resonates the mass of your skull which in turn resonates the cartilaginous portion and plugging your ear prevents that from escaping here i'm sending bone conduction through a tuning fork and with my voice my bone conduction is happening through my skull this way okay so at any rate back to today so you got two tuning fork tests bing occlusion effect rene air conduction versus bone conduction. And the Rene is an eloquent demonstration of what the middle ear does in overcoming the impedance mismatch between air and fluid. And why do you need that? Like we said last week, otherwise airborne sound would not be able to activate a fluid-filled cochlea. Always remember, sound waves don't go into a cochlea. They can't get in there, it's too small. 250 hertz is like four feet long. That's not going to get into a cochlea that when you unroll it is one inch. Okay, so sound waves are not the water waves that are made in the cochlea. The waves made in the cochlea are called traveling waves, and they are transverse waves. They actually go up and down, perpendicular to the, they may be moving this way, but the up and down motion is perpendicular to the direction of their movement. Sound waves, we know, don't do that. Sound waves are longitudinal. All right, hold all these little definitions, and it just works a whole lot better, more better. All right, I'll put these tuning forks over here, and we'll look at our notes and our PowerPoint, and we'll see where we're going here, because the next part we go to is the acoustic reflex. The acoustic reflex. So I'll make it bigger. You're looking at the stapedius muscle and the tensor tympani muscle. Stapedius muscle tensor tympani muscle. The stapedius muscle is innervated by the seventh pair of cranial nerves, and the tensor tympani muscle is innervated by the fifth pair of cranial nerves. Remember, you got 12 pairs. Three deal with the ear. The eighth cranial nerve sends info to the brain from the inner ear, and the fifth and seventh cranial nerves work the acoustic reflex. Now, what the heck is that acoustic reflex, and why do we have it? So let's look at the acoustic reflex carefully. This is a weird diagram. It's kind of busy, but wait till you see the next one. Yikes. Just follow me here carefully, okay? Way too many things. I'll explain what it is. Ear canal, my cursor, ear drum, and then the malleus and incus are drawn very poorly here. Malleus and incus and stapes. And then this honeycomb thing here, that, oh, that's the inner ear or cochlea. So the message is sent outer ear to middle ear, activating the cochlea, which talks to the eighth cranial nerve. And the eighth cranial nerve is about an inch long, and it sends info to the brain stem. Now, all of this is a blown up view of the brain stem. What is the brain stem? It's the spinal cord inside your skull. Okay? The spinal cord going inside your skull. It's about as big as your pinky. And it goes from your from your back, your, it starts at your rear, at your bottom of your back, goes all the way up your back and then enters the brain. And it's about one inch long. And the eighth nerve is one of the 12 pairs of cranial nerves that is attached to it. Okay? And inside that brain stem are all these little pieces and parts. And that's what that slide was showing you. It's just a schematic. So we'll look at that slide. All of these round things inside. Don't worry about what they are now. I don't really care. Just call this whole area brain stem. So info goes up the eighth nerve to the brain stem and then 
info is sent back out to the stapedius muscle to contract. See how it's attached to the neck, to the, to the stapes? And out the fifth cranial nerve to the tensor tympani muscle. So you've got the seventh cranial nerve, the fifth cranial nerve, and the eighth cranial nerve. The eighth cranial nerve, call it afferent. It sends to the brain, info to the brain. The fifth and the seventh, these messages are efferent, E-F-F-E-R-E-N-T. Think exit, exiting the brain, going out from the brain, afferent going at the brain, okay? A for at, E for X, exit. So you've got, a, and that's called the acoustic reflex arc, the afferent loop and the efferent loop. And what's really cool is that you've got the eighth nerve sending info to the brainstem and then info going back out to pull on these muscles. So when a loud sound, message from, is sent to the brain, because when the cochlea is activated by a loud sound, that message is sent to the brain stem, telling these two nerves to send muscle messages to these muscles to contract, to cause the acoustic reflex. But the neat thing here is that if you get a loud sound in one ear, the reflex happens in both ears. Because if a loud message about a loud sound is sent up the eighth cranial nerve, it's not just this stapedius muscle that contracts and this tensor tympani, it's also the other ear stapedius muscle and the other ear tensor tympani. Why is that? Because nerve messages crisscross. They call that decussation. D-E-C-U-S-S. A-T-I-O-N, decussation, crossover. So a loud, a, sound, a, a loud sound in this ear will cause an acoustic reflex in both ears. A loud sound in this ear causes an acoustic reflex in both ears. Why? Because messages cross over. As well as going the same, they also cross over. Okay? So now let's look at my slide of this same thing. Mine's a little bit more colorful. Well, still black and white, but... There you go. Outer ear canal, eardrum, malleus, incus, stapes. Okay. And then you've got <clears throat> message sent to the cochlea, up the eighth nerve, to the brain stem. And then the arrow is going back. The fifth cranial nerve to the tensor tympani, the seventh cranial nerve to the stapedius. And the same thing happens on the other side. Okay, again, a loud sound in one ear causes an acoustic reflex in both ears. The afferent root, the efferent route. Nicely drawn there for you. Okay, <clears throat> I'll stop. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll go to the notes here and see where we are. Let's read what it says about the acoustic reflexes. Oh, resonance is summary, middle ear adds about this much, say about, uh, you know, I'd say 30 to 35, correct that, that should be fixed. This is because, and especially, eh, don't worry about that, ah, da, 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 da. and the outer ear adds about 20 to 25 between these, yep, that makes sense, okay. Recall acoustics, together these resonances give rise to the loud, to the curves that we talked about. More will be covered in this after the midterm, so don't worry about it now. Sometimes that curve is called minimal audible field, and sometimes the white curve, the way you heard um, un with one ear under a headphone, is called minimal audible pressure. Minimal audible field is with two ears. Minimal audible field pressure, I should say, is with one ear, and two ears are about five decibels better than one, and blah, blah, blah. We'll talk about it later. So let's go to the notes now again. Acoustic reflexes. Tensor tympani and stapedius muscle. Of these two, the stapedius muscle is the strongest. The tensor tympani is innervated by the fifth nerve, often called trigeminal, because it has three branches, tri as in three. Stapedius is innervated by the seventh facial nerve, the, mer the nerve that really work works your cheeks. The reflex arc includes an afferent brain going and efferent back to ear directions. 
Afferent, middle ear to cochlea to eighth nerve to low brain stem, crossover, decussation happens here. You'd think I wrote these notes. Efferent, the fifth cranial nerve, back to the tensor tympani, seventh cranial nerve, back to the stapedius muscle. The acoustic reflexes occur in one, both ears, even though only one ear is stimulated. Why? Because of neural decussation in the reflex arc. The acoustic reflex is caused by incoming pure tones that are over or approximately 80 decibels. Also caused by chewing. Don't worry about broadband noises, blah, 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 blah. By chew, well, that would make sense too. By chewing, and I'll get to broadband in just a second here. When you're chewing a bag of chips, and you wonder why you're having trouble hearing the TV, it's not only because of the crunch, crunch you're hearing, but it's also because chewing often causes your acoustic reflexes to kick in. And the acoustic reflexes make the middle ear work more poorly. The acoustic reflexes help to attenuate sounds. The middle ear is very stiff. The middle ear doesn't have much mass. It's the eardrum. If you look at the end of my finger, that's about the size of an eardrum. It's the, the round part here. And the bones could all fit on Shucks, I got a, a coin around here. Well, you know how big a nickel is. They'll all fit on a penny. So there's not much mass in the middle ear. Okay? The middle ear is stiffness dominated. It's very stiff. Doesn't have much mass. So it's a stiff system. And when you have the acoustic reflexes, they tighten, they make it even more stiff. Okay, so the middle ear works best when it's least stiff. It's got to be fairly stiff, otherwise it won't work very well. But the middle ear, when the acoustic reflex happens, you're tightening that already stiff system, and you're making the middle ear work more poorly. That's what the acoustic reflexes are for. They're meant to make the middle ear work more poorly when they pull. That's why you have them. They attenuate sound. They lessen the amplitude of sound. Why do you have them? Some people think of the acoustic reflex as nature's own protection against noise-induced hearing loss. Think about it. Kind of makes sense. That's, it's only partly true. What's a very, very common loud sound for your ears to hear? And the answer is your own speech. You for yourself. Remember, you hear yourself differently than others hear you. When you hear yourself on a recording, you're the only one that doesn't like your, the sound of your voice. Everybody else says that sounds just like you. When you're listening to a recording of your own voice, you are hearing yourself as others hear you. What does that mean in plain English? You're hearing yourself by air conduction only, not through bone. You're here. The recording is coming from a, a, a CD player or DVD or whatever it is that's recorded you. <clears throat> and then the sound is traveling through sound waves going to your ear. Air conduction. When you, he talk, when you hear yourself talk, you're hearing yourself through air conduction, but also through bone. And what did we say in acoustics? What's the average intensity? in DBSPL of good old conversational speech, average conversational speech, everyday talking, yada, 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 from about one yard away. What's the average loudness? About 65 DBSPL. That's by air conduction. So if somebody's talking to you at three feet away and you're hearing that person around 65 DBSPL, okay? When you yourself talk, you're hearing yourself at around 80, 85, and that's enough to cause the acoustic reflex. So the acoustic reflex is there to help dull the loudness of your own voice while you speak. Okay, and the acoustic reflex is actually strongest when loud sounds are low pitched. Not when high-pitched sounds are loud. 
you'll get a little bit of an acoustic reflex. They'll really kick in if you make a 500 hertz tone loud. That'll, <clears throat> but if you make a 4,000 hertz tone really loud, eh, eh. Now, what's the significance of that? Well, what's the loudest parts of speech? What did we say this morning in 110? The loudest parts of speech are the vowels, the stuff coming from your throat. A, E, I, O, U, M, Z, Z, V, G, B, D. All sounds that when you put your hand to your throat, your throat vibrates, those sounds are louder and lower. Whereas sounds like S, Ch, F, okay, those sounds are consonants. They're high pitched and they're not voiced. Can't feel that vibrate. Can't feel it vibrate. This isn't vibrating. Any sound that you make in speech that doesn't make your throat vibrate is high pitched. So the loudest parts of speech are the low pitched sounds. And those are what cause the acoustic reflex. Okay, you'll learn more about this next week in acoustics as well when we look at the unique acoustics of speech. We're going to really look at speech big time next week. Anyway, share screen and see where we're going here. So all of this, how much to, so here's that broadband noise. What does that mean? A sound that's got lots of different frequencies in it. Not just a 1,000 hertz tone, a 2,000 hertz, but a whole bunch of them, a whole bouquet of them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> here, I'll tell you a joke here. What do you, what do you what's this? A bouquet of these. <laughs> anyway, just thought I'd throw that at you. Maybe they'll fire me now. Oops. Okay. So, broadband means a sound that's got a whole bunch of frequencies. Well, what an example of that is speech. Okay, so when speech gets to be more than 60, 65, it'll kick in the acoustic reflex. And the acoustic reflex dulls sound by about 5 to 10 dB. Some authors say more like 15 or 14. You know, some just, but by several dB at least. And they are loudest, the acoustic reflex is strongest for loud, low frequency sounds more than loud, high-frequency sounds. They help reduce what's called the upward spread of masking. What does that mean, upward spread of masking? I'll tell you what that means. And you'll learn more about this later on in the acoustics course as well. And you'll learn more about this when we cover the inner ear. So I'm just kind of giving you a bit of a heads up. Just, I always like to take two steps forward and then one back. Two steps forward, one back. Ah, boy, you should see how much snow we've got here. Oh, man, it is just like crazy. We haven't had snow all winter until this week. And now it's made up for lost time, I'm telling you. So, upward spread of masking. It means that low pitch, it's got nothing to do with Halloween or wearing a mask, but masking means covering up one sound with another. Okay, so let's say you're trying to hear somebody talk, and then somebody starts working a blender in the kitchen, and you can't hear the person talking anymore. That's because this loud sound from the blender is masking the person you want to hear, the person's voice that you want to hear. So masking means to cover up one sound with another. Okay, upward spread of masking means low frequencies cover high frequencies better than high frequencies cover low frequencies. So the rumbling of a truck will mask the peeping of a canary much better than the loud peeping of a canary will cover up the low pitch rumble of a truck. Okay, and what are important high pitched sounds for us to hear? The high pitched consonants. S, F, C, H, TH, K, P, all these, okay, those are high pitched sounds and they're softer. And what's a common loud low pitched sound? Background noise. Just good old background noise. 
background noise tends to be mostly low frequency. Okay, to even just think of the hubbub or babble of background party cocktail noise, blah, 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 okay, tends to be low pitched. You know what the biggest complaint of hearing aid wearers is? Background noise. Second biggest complaint of hearing aid wearers, occlusion effect. See, all these things play together. So when you look at acoustics and you look at anatomy, these are like the two pillars that hold up the entire HIS program. It's very important to digest and weave, literally weave together the concepts that you're learning in 110 and 120, because these are used constantly in our field. When we're talking gain of a hearing aid, input SPL, output SPL, DB is in gain, you know, or gain is in DB, all this stuff, it kind of works together. Anyway, so upward spread of masking. Background noise tends to be a quite an effective masker of the all-important high-frequency consonants that we need to hear to tell what the word was. Did we say Paul or call? Okay, they all have all, but it's the p -k that tells you what the word is. Vowels are cheap. You've only got five of them. And every word, we have thousands of words in English. Every word has a vowel. So vowels are cheap. They don't tell you at all what the word is. It's what's surrounding the vowels that tells you what the word is. And, the, and what surrounds the vowels is usually high pitched. You can think about background noise like a bull in a china shop. And the china teacups are the high frequency consonants. They're very, very easily smashed. Okay, lows mask highs, better than highs mask lows. When we look at the inner ear in several weeks from now, further in this course, we will learn why we have the upward spread of masking. It has everything to do with the way the cochlea works. So we'll look at that manana, not now. For now, we've just discovered the term, the upward spread of masking. And the acoustic reflexes, because they are strongest, for low frequencies, they tend to reduce the upward spread of masking because they retard or they attenuate the loudness of low frequency sounds. Very good. The acoustic reflex takes a few milliseconds to occur. It's not instant. And that's why gunshot, like bang, is too quick for the acoustic reflex to catch up to. So gunshots, with that hunters are, are exposed to, okay, that can cause noise-induced hearing loss and the, the acoustic reflex, there's a little bit of a time delay for it to occur. So the acoustic reflex doesn't help much against protecting from the loudness of sudden impact, quick loud sounds. So there's a common misconception here that the acoustic reflex is nature's protection against all noise exposure. It really isn't that much true. It, they mainly reduce the loudness of your own voice while you speak. Recall from acoustics, low frequency vowels are louder than high frequency consonants. Average conversational speech heard from others by air conduction is around 65 dB SPL. We hear ourselves louder because we hear ourselves by both air and bone conduction. That's enough to cause the acoustic reflex. Recall they are the strongest for low frequencies and low frequency vowels contribute most to the loudness of our voices. There you go. That's the physiology of the middle ear. So we've covered it all now, the anatomy and the physiology of the middle ear. We'll take a brief look at disorders of the middle ear, but remember this summer you have an eight-week course called Hearing Disorders. So we'll look at this again much more thoroughly in that time, but let me just introduce you in this anatomy unit on the middle ear as to some of the main disorders of the middle ear. The big one is otitis media. Oto, ear, itis, inflammation, media, middle. Okay, it's the big one. This is the one that's the most common by far. And it has stages. Look at the chapters here, one through six. The first chapter 
is a sore throat. So little Johnny gets a sore throat. Let's look at his sore throat. Here. Here's a little kid. He gets a sore throat. What happens when you've got a sore throat? Your tonsils are swollen. When your tonsils are swollen, your eustachian tube won't open when you swallow. Remember the eustachian tube? It's closed unless forced open. It's normally closed. The middle ear is a closed space. And it's always absorbing oxygen. And when you yawn or when you swallow, your eustachian tube opens for just a second, letting new air get into the middle ear space. That's how the middle ear gets new air, okay? So if the eustachian tube is swollen shut because of swollen tonsils, that's what we call an upper respiratory infection. And now the middle ear no longer gets any new air, and because there's always a vacuum in the middle ear, or now, there, now you're getting a vacuum in the middle ear space. And the eardrum is sucked inward, and that's called an earache. Okay, it's what, that's what an earache is. Later on, your body begins to rebel, and it fills that middle ear space with fluid. And at first, the fluid is non-infectious. It's called serous, S-E-R-O-U-S, serous fluid. Like the fluid under a blister. It's clear, it's just there, okay? After several days, that fluid gets infected. And now the fluid is white in color. And now it's called pus. And now the ear, the whole eardrum is bulging. Okay, now the eardrum is bulging outward. So first of all, the middle ear space becomes, later on, the middle ear space becomes, all right, vacuum first, then serous fluid, and then the serous fluid turns white, pus filled. Otitis media. It has early stages, that's the vacuum. Middle stage, serous fluid, pus, advanced otitis media. Making your middle ear act like an earplug. You always remember, conductive hearing loss is like an earplug. That's the way to think about it. Excessive wax, earplug. Okay, otitis media, earplug. And what does conductive hearing loss then do? It makes the hearing loss equal across the frequencies. It'll cause maybe a 30 or 40 or 50 decibel hearing loss at 125, at 250, at 500, at 1,000, maybe a little bit less at 2,000 because that's the resonance of the middle ear ossicles, and then about a 50 dB loss at 4,000, 50 dB at 8. So a fairly flat hearing loss. We call that a flat hearing loss because conductive hearing loss is like a ding-dong plug. It's a plug in your ear. That's how you can think about it. When you are outside mowing the lawn with a loud lawnmower and you don't want to hear that, you put earplugs in your ears. You're giving yourself a conductive hearing loss on purpose. Okay, that's what you're doing. So always think of a conductive hearing loss as rendering rather fairly the similar degree of hearing loss across all the frequencies. And with otitis media, a little bit less, maybe 40-ish at 2,000 hertz due to the resonance of the middle ear ossicles. Other than that, it's fairly flat. So, share screen. And why do kids get earaches more than adults? It's because in an adult, the eustachian tube is more vertical. So we have gravity working in our favor. Our faces grow longer as we grow through puberty. Little kids have flatter faces. They're shorter. So the eustachian tubes are more horizontal. As we grow through puberty, our skulls elongate. So our the eustachian tubes become more vertical. So the infection doesn't as easily get into the middle ear space. That's why we tend to grow out of ear aches. Pretty wild. Here's a normal eardrum. When you're looking at the normal eardrum, you can see a kind of the manubrium of the malleus. 
You can even see the long process of the Incas and a little bit of the stapes. And you'll see a cone of light. And that cone of light is a reflection of the light of your otoscope. Okay, it's not really there. It's just a reflection of the light of your otoscope. And in the right ear, it's seen at 5 o'clock. And in the left ear, it's seen at 7 o'clock. Now, here is a retracted tympanic membrane due to a vacuum in the middle ear space. Look at how the eardrum is sucked back against the, the, one of the, uh, the arms of the uh, incus. Here's the neck of the stapes. Here's the promontory bone between the oval window that would be here and the round window that would be below. So the eardrum is sucked back. Here's serous otitis media. Now you've got clear fluid bubbles as seen behind the eardrum. And then it turns into acute bulging pus-filled otitis media. So it's often called purulent, P-U-R-U-L-E-N-T, or suppurative, S-U-P-P-U-R-A-T-I-V. Okay, suppurative or purulent otitis media. So let's go to our notes here and read. Upper respiratory infection, vacuum behind the ear, serous otitis media, now it becomes purulent. And now in certain rare cases, the infection can invade the mastoid bone. Remember we said the mastoid bone is very porous. It has lots of holes in it. And remember we said the roof of the middle ear space is only an eighth of an inch from the brain. So let's just see what that looks like in a picture. Middle ear space. Mastoid bone. If the infection invades the mastoid bone, it's too late for any antibiotics to help. They've got to drill out the middle ear space. They take out the ossicles, they remove the whole middle ear. They've got to get at that mastoiditis because the, the brain is right here. And if the brain gets infected, that's meningitis, and then you're dead. Now, we usually don't get to the stages of mastoiditis and meningitis anymore. We used to in days of yore, but not anymore. Okay, that's yesterday's, more yesterday's problem. But once in a while, you may encounter elderly people who have a weird incision behind their ear, and they've got a really weird looking ear canal. That's because they had mastoiditis as a kid, and the doctors had to burr out the middle ear bones. So they got a big hearing loss in that ear. Okay, anyway, if you're looking at the stages now of otitis media, Basically, the ones to really know are these first four. The treatment for otitis media, antibiotics, PE tubes, or tonsil tonsillectomy. Why tonsillectomy? To get rid of the swelling around the end of the eustachian tubes in the throat. Tonsillectomies often reduce otitis media. So if we look at this, we'll look at our otitis media here. Scroll down till we, till we see little Johnny again. Here's a PE tube. Well, here's a tube that they did. They did a myringotomy. They did a slit in the eardrum and stuck a tube in there. So that if the eustachian tubes are always closed, new air can still get into the middle ear space through a permanent little hole that they made in the eardrum. Now, I say permanent means after a few months, this falls out. Recall the eardrum, the skin grows kind of like in a spiral out. And eventually, this tube will meet the side of the ear canal and it'll fall out. So tubes are not meant to be in there permanently. They're meant to be in there for several months. But they really reduce otitis media because they're allowing new air to get in. So in other words, if the front door of the eustachian tubes doesn't work, let's just make a new back door. Okay, either way. So the three treatments for otitis media, antibiotics, pressure equalizing tubes, or tonsillectomies. Okay, look at the notes here. What's another disorder? Otosclerosis. 
Let's see if I have a picture of otosclerosis. It's not as common. Well, here's the hearing loss, by the way, of otitis media. Have a look at this. The X's are the left ear, the O's are the right ear, and the person was wearing headphones, and you could see about a 40 or 50 decibel flat hearing loss with a little bit better hearing at 2,000 hertz. It took a little bit less decibels for the person to just barely hear 2,000 hertz due to the resonance of the middle ear ossicles. And then look at these greater than signs. Those refer to the fact that now you took the headphones off and you put a little bone oscillator. You have a headband with a little black box sitting right on the mastoid bone. And now you're delivering the tones through that. And when you're delivering the tones through bone conduction, the hearing is perfectly normal. The person hears at about five to zero decibels. See that? These are frequencies along the top. This is decibels it took to just barely hear. So this, this is a big important finding because it means this is an air bone gap. The difference between the way you heard through bone versus the way you heard through air. That's a conductive hearing loss, an air bone gap. Do you see this? That's what we meant earlier when I was talking about air bone gaps. Okay? It means that when you've avoided the middle ear, you bypassed the outer ear, you bypassed the middle ear, and you delivered the sound by bone conduction or with the headband and the little black box delivering the tone by bone conduction. The person may then hear perfectly well because you've bypassed the outer ear and you bypassed the middle ear and the sound went straight to the cochlea or inner ear and the person heard like a baby. Whereas through air conduction, it was the otitis media that blocked the sound. So the person heard better by bone and worse through air. It's the same thing with that Rene tuning forks. This versus this made no difference. Air conduction was no louder than bone. Why? Because the middle ear was blocking the air conduction. So when you've got otitis media, the middle ear is blocking the passage of sound because of the infection. So bone conduction will be perfectly normal and air conduction will show a big hearing loss. Air bone gap. Okay, that means a conductive hearing loss. Share screen. Back to PowerPoint, otitis media. What's another pathology? Here's a cholesteatoma. This is a tumor that grows because you've had a burst eardrum due to otitis media. Look at this, the eardrum might burst. And then you'll have a hole near the edge of the eardrum. And that hole doesn't heal properly. And the skin tries to heal that hole. And it tries too hard to heal that hole. And then finally, it turns into crazy cells. And the crazy cells multiply and multiply and multiply. And they create a tumor. It's a cholesteatoma. Now you've got a tumor behind the eardrum. And the treatment for that is get it out fast. Because that tumor is fast growing, it'll fill the middle ear space, it'll invade the mastoid, and get to the brain. Cholesteatoma. Anytime you see oma, doesn't mean grandma in German or Dutch, it means tuma. Okay? Osteoma, cholesteatoma, eighth nerve, neuroma, okay? I need tumor, oma, okay? Osteoma. Here's an osteoma, but that's an outer ear thing. This is just bony growths called swimmer's ear type of thing. We covered that earlier. Oh, here's the cone of light at 7 o'clock in the left ear, cone of light at 5 o'clock in the right ear. Here's a myringotomy being made so that they can put in a pressure equalizing tube. Here's otosclerosis. Now, this is a hereditary pathology. And it's got not much to do with an infection. There's no infection at all. It usually hits in young adulthood. The person's in his early 20s and starts to get a hearing loss in one ear and maybe a little bit in the other ear as well. It's usually bilateral. Maybe in one ear it's a little worse than in the other. But he got it from mom or dad. It's hereditary. And it doesn't usually hit until you're a young adult. And what is it? 
a soft, porous growth of bone around the footplate of the stapes. Sclerosis is a dumb name because sclerosis means hardening. It really, you could call it like osteoporosis that women get, you know, in, in, the, in the back, uh, like a, a, a decaying of bone, a soft, the softness of bone tissue, okay, that women can get postmenopause, osteoporosis. You can call, in a, in a weird way, you could call this otoporosis, okay? It's a soft growth of bone around the footplate of the stapes. But they call, have called it for years otosclerosis. And what it does is it makes the footplate of the stapes no longer be able to push in and out of the oval window. What did we say causes a hearing loss that's greater than what the middle ear makes up? Something that prevents the interchange of the oval and round window. What else will do that? A cholesteatoma? What do you call it? Otitis media? Think about it. If the whole entire middle ear is filled with pus, do you think this round window is going to be able to bulge out? I think not. And that is why any pathology like good old otitis media or otosclerosis or any of these it can be larger than the 35 dB that the middle ear is making up because you're preventing that interchange from happening. Cholesteatoma, otos, not this. Oh, this has nothing to do with it. Oh, this is an outer ear pathology. Again, cone of light, myringotomy. We're just about all done here. Otosclerosis. What's the procedure done for otosclerosis is a stapedectomy. They often take out the stapes and they put a titanium metal wire into a piece of fat. They make a new oval window sort of. Remember oval window, promontory, round window. Okay, stapedectomy, a treatment for otosclerosis. Otosclerosis is also a flat hearing loss. Just like otitis media, fairly flat. Only otitis media, their loss is more like, has, but they're both quite similar. But look at the unique thing. With otitis media, there's a bit of an improvement at 2K in air conduction because that's what the O's and the X's represent, right ear by headphone, left ear by headphone, and these signs at the top represent bone conduction. When you're looking at otosclerosis, whoops, the hearing loss is fairly flat, around 40 to 50, but you've got a drop in bone conduction. In bone conduction, not, instead of an improvement in air conduction at two, there's a drop in bone conduction at 2,000 hertz. And that drop is called Carhartt's Notch. Raymond Carhartt was the father of audiology. He literally invented this field, okay, shortly after World War II. And Raymond Carhartt was someone who really looked at otosclerosis, and he noticed this odd drop in bone conduction. And we won't explain it now. We won't look at it so much now. But we'll look more at that in terms of 125 this summer, hearing disorders. If I escape here and look at our notes, where have we gone? There's otosclerosis, hereditary, more in Caucasians, more often in women, especially when pregnant, since the fetus is robbing mummy of calcium, and she's then more prone to having otosclerosis. Treatments, stapedectomy, every time you see the word ecto means out, ectoderm, outer layer, stapedectomy, take it out, or hearing aids. Some people don't opt for a stapedectomy. They don't want it, okay? They just say, give me hearing aids instead because maybe the surgery won't work. Sometimes the surgery backfires and really makes things worse. So cholesteatoma, you have that. We finish here with patulous or patent eustachian tubes. That can happen in people who've lost weight too quickly, or people who have a dietary disorder, or people who are on chemotherapy. And what that is, is the eustachian tubes are never closed because there's not enough fatty tissue to keep them closed.
And so the person hears him or herself really loudly, like in a barrel, because the sound from the voice is going through those constantly open eustachian tubes. Remember, eustachian tubes are usually closed unless forced open, when you yawn or swallow or whatever. So that can happen in a person who's got an eating disorder or who's lost weight too quickly. And by eating disorder, I mean who doesn't eat enough, okay, Getting, trying to get thin too quickly. Or in someone who's on treatment for cancer, chemotherapy, whatever. Patulous or patent eustachian tube. So four essential disorders of the middle ear. Otitis media is the big one. Oh, cholesteatoma, fairly rare, but it can happen as a side effect from repeated bouts of otitis media. Otosclerosis, which is not as common, and it's hereditary. Patulous or patent eustachian tubes, a rather odd one, not that common. But there you have it. We've now finished the middle ear. So next week, we'll begin on unit, I believe it's unit four, on the inner ear anatomy. Inner ear anatomy. We'll spend two weeks on inner ear anatomy. Then we'll spend two more weeks on inner ear physiology. You see how we did this? You spent a week on the outer ear. You spent three weeks on the middle ear. We'll spend at least four on the inner ear. Things get busier as you go in. It's interesting. Okay, I'll stop recording here and bid you adieu, live long and prosper. We'll see you when we look at you. Bye for now.